let's roll here. This is uh, First Star Let's Chat, session 36. This is the OCAA panel this evening. Uh, joining us, we have guests from across the OCAA. We're going to talk about uh, athletic therapy in this time, athletic therapy in the collegiate setting. Um, as always, these sessions are brought to you by our primary sponsor, uh, Mobility Tape, the only heat-activated kinesiology tape on the market. Um, Jay and his crew at Mobility Tape is willing to open this offer up one final week here. So uh, the next five people to join up for the memberships for the CEUs will be sent a roll of Mobility Tape free of charge uh, from Mobility Tape and their crew over there. So uh, feel free to jump in. You can do that through under courses on our website, firststartherapy.com. Reach out through Instagram at firststar.therapy. Uh, at MT Mobility Tape is their handle on Instagram. So that's the that's the brief rundown on the sponsorship deal. Uh, we're going to jump in here with the ground rules and then get into the bios and we'll get into some really rich conversation tonight, no doubt about it. Um, so uh, ground rules. We are being recorded for the purposes of saving the OCAA and other collegiate institutes, uh, institutions uh, across the globe uh, and saving the world one or one, two, three, four, five, however many conversations we have this evening at a time. Um, but in all seriousness, for the purposes of the archive, this will be posted on um, on podcast and YouTube for future reference to go back on um, and review as you wish. For all of you joining us live, really appreciate it this evening. And then for those of you picking it up, um, archived, uh, keep spreading the word because we're growing this thing and it's, it's becoming a, a hot topic and lots of interest in all the speakers that we have on tonight. So the OCAA panel, thank you all for being here this evening. We had five guest schedules uh, scheduled to be here, uh, one of which dropped off. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but we have four here present. I'll go through the bios. Uh, when I finish your bio, maybe just say hello so that we can see your face um, or so that everybody can see your face and at least acknowledge. I know your name's on the screen, but let's do it anyway, just for the podcast sake, you can say hello. All right. So Saul Berman has worked with Durham College and Ontario Tech University since 2011. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology in 2007 at York University. He then returned to York and obtained his athletic ther therapy certificate in 2010. He actually got his first start in the Oshawa area, uh, working with a variety of football teams in the Oshawa Hawkeyes organization. After completing his certificate, uh, his certification, he worked at a private multidisciplinary clinic in Woodbridge for several years and landed an opportunity to work at the 2015 Pan Am Games at the track and field venue. His experience at Durham College in Ontario Tech has allowed him to work at multiple provincial and national championships. He was also a CATA Merit Award winner in 2017. He's previously taught as a sessional lecturer at Durham College with the Fitness and Health Promotion Program and is now a lab instructor at Ontario Tech University. Saul, you want to say hi to everybody? Really appreciate your time being here. Hey, James. Thanks so much for having me. A uh, big fan of the platform you've created here so, and uh, of all the people on the panel. So I'm really excited to uh, be on today. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, and the beard is looking nice in COVID. I don't think I've seen you with the full beard working. So congratulations on that as progress. well. Yeah. yeah, no, really appreciate you Pandemic. being here um, and look forward to you sharing uh, all of your opportunities and, and your experiences with everybody. So uh, we'll jump right back into the bios here with our next one. Jennifer Bell is a graduate from the athletic therapy program at York University. She's been a certified athletic therapist for over 15 years and providing therapy to Humber athletes uh, at Humber College for 14 years. She has numerous continuing education courses that she implements in her treatments and is currently pursuing her master's in human kinetics. Jennifer sits on numerous committees, both provincially and nationally, and is committed to lifelong learning and promotion of the profession. Outside of Humber, Jennifer has had the pleasure of working with the national lacrosse teams, including winning the world championship in 2015 and the national artistic swimming program. She's a busy mom to three young children, ranging in age from two to seven years old, and is involved in her local sporting and school communities. When she has free time, keyword being when, uh, she enjoys hiking, reading, and getting together with family and friends. Jen, thanks a lot for being here, especially for, uh, you know, a, a busy life, obviously, for you and, and getting the kids set aside so that we can have some of your time <laughs> as well. So appreciate that. Thank you for having me, James. Yes, when I have free time, I join in to, to panels like this and uh, make sure to check you out. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you and, and such a, a wealth of knowledge and, and you know, well known through Ontario, certainly, and, and through the CATA, through the Education Committee and all the things that you've been doing behind the scenes and, and up front as well. So look forward to picking your brain and seeing where things are at, where things are going uh, in your world as well. So appreciate you being here. Steve Kopas uh, received his BSc in kinesiology from the University of Waterloo in 2002 
While at Waterloo, he began his interest in athletic therapy uh, as a student therapist for the varsity rugby and varsity volleyball teams. In 2005, he received his Diploma of Sports Injury Management from Sheridan College and became certified that summer. Steve has worked a variety of sports over the years, including soccer, figure skating, beach volleyball, rugby, football, baseball, baton twirling, and lacrosse from grassroots to world championships. We're going to come back to baton twirling because that's not a common one. Absolutely. Um, since 2009, he's been the athletic therapy coordinator at Seneca College, where he oversees 15 varsity teams, two part-time certified therapists, and six to eight student therapists from Sheridan and York University. Concussion management has become a focus for Steve over the past few years. He's developed a protocol to assist athletes to receive quicker academic accommodations following a concussion. He's currently the lead therapist on the OCAA Athletic Therapy Committee and continues to strive to have athletic therapists employed at colleges across Ontario and Canada. Steve, welcome and appreciate you being here this evening. You just want to say hello and uh, I'm sure we got lots to touch on uh, based on that bio and everything we get into this evening. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, looking forward to, to talking to everybody and uh, helping to promote athletic therapy within, like you say. And uh, yeah, uh, the baton trolling, you can ask away on that later on as well. <laughs> I look forward to it. I have uh, my pseudo baton right here. When I read that one, I just brought something out. Maybe we could try something <laughs> with it. All right. Um, Kelly Patchell is unable to be here this evening due to her current work uh, in um, – public health and disease control. She's actually been working at a long-term care facility, uh, had a positive COVID test, uh, COVID case as of this morning. So she messaged uh, with her regards. Um, and so she had to take care of that. She's spending time in that long-term facility. So she was unable to get away this evening. Uh, but Kelly Patchell completed her undergraduate degree in kinesiology at Acadia University, followed by her master's degree at York University in kinesiology with her certificate in athletic therapy. She's worked in a variety of settings with, with club to elite level athletes and has worked with varsity athletes at Acadia, York, Carleton, and U of T, as well as working with the Toronto Argonauts and Ottawa Fury. She was fortunate to be part of the host medical staff for the FIFA Women's World Cup in Ottawa. A strong believer in active recovery, Kelly incorporates craniosacral therapy, vestibular therapy, oculomotor retraining, and soft tissue release with exercise prescription to return clients to activity as quickly and safely as possible. Concussion recognition and management have been main focuses of Kelly's continuing education with courses in craniosacral therapy, vestibular therapy, and impact concussion software. Outside of clinic work, Kelly also teaches sports, uh, sports injuries as part of the fitness and health promotion program at Algonquin College, where she is a certified athletic therapist. So I didn't mention that at the beginning. Um, and as I said, she sends her regards, but doing, uh, doing some high quality community work. So uh, we wish her the best with that. And uh, we'll move on to Kim Strosser, who joined the Saints athletics team at St. Clair College in 2014. She is a Windsor native who earned her undergraduate degree in human kinetics at the University of Windsor. She went on to complete her athletic therapy degree at Sheridan College. She worked with the Hamilton Tiger Cats at the CFL, and following this, then worked to complete her massage therapy diploma from the Ontario College of Health and Technology. After working in Hamilton for a few years and obtaining her medical acupuncture certificate from McMaster University, she decided to return to do her Master's of Rehabilitation Sciences at Mac McMaster as well. She graduated in 2016 and presented her research at International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine World Congress in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 2017. A nice trip on many levels, I would hope. Uh, she holds various certificates such as ACE massage, cupping, soft tissue release, mulligans, and many more. She's a registered kinesiologist, certified athletic therapist, registered massage therapist, and a Red Cross first responder instructor. Kim, welcome. Uh, I'll let you say hello, and then uh, you'll be the leader on this first one. How are you? Hi, James. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, great. Awesome. I'm excited to host all of you guys. Uh, we've talked at least maybe once or twice in person, otherwise through email or phone, um, and really looking forward to sort of sharing the wealth of knowledge that is uh, housed within the OCAA and within each one of you, because I think sharing information, sharing knowledge of your career, as well as your vision of what athletic therapy is and can be goes a long way in sort of supporting all of us. And, and like we talked about Wednesday night on sort of a special edition COVID in the pro sport landscape, uh, I think the support aspect of this and just making yourselves accessible to each other and, and with us is is fantastic. So, Kim, let's start with you. Maybe uh, we heard your bio and, and it's it's an amazing one. You know, you've got a lot of a lot of the academic side of things. Um, maybe just give us some highlights or, or your career path, uh, a summary, and then we'll work our way back through the panel and then jump into some specific questions after that. 
Sure. Um, so I got into athletic therapy when I was uh, doing my undergrad at University of Windsor. Um, so I was in about third year and I was doing a um, internship with the Windsor Spitfires, so our local hockey team here. Um, at that time, I didn't really know kind of what I wanted to do yet. I was, you know, toying with the idea of teacher's college or chiropractor school, physio. Um, I had no idea what athletic therapy was, but uh, when I was young, I remember watching sports and um, seeing the people kind of run out on the field when someone got injured and thinking, wow, like that, that would be really cool. And I, I just never even really knew what it was. Um, so while I was doing my internship, they had uh, placed me with the Spitz because uh, they knew I had an interest uh, of working in sport, uh, but they had put me kind of in the marketing side of things, which I wasn't. Uh, really keen on. Uh, one day uh, I was waiting for a ride home actually and the the athletic therapist was kind of in the hallway doing a shoulder assessment and I was like whoa what's this guy doing this looks awesome so I just I started asking him questions and um, I was really uh, intrigued by it and um, very soon after I think like the next week I was switched into an internship with him um, and that was Joey Garland um, so he was kind of my first experience with a, a certified athletic therapist, and um, he really shaped kind of the way that my career progressed. Um, he told me about Sheridan College. Um, I, I applied. I ended up getting into the advanced standing program, so I started um, in their second year. I had an amazing um, experience at Sheridan. I met a ton of great people, the the teachers there. Everyone kind of that I met was really influential in, in kind of my, my career, um, and after I graduated, I, in between graduating and um, uh, writing my certification exam, I had got an opportunity to work for the Thai Cats for their training camp. Um, at this point, I was actually offered a job at the Detroit Medical Center, which I was so excited for because I, I was ready to move home. I had been away for three years and um, I was excited to work, you know, at a facility that um, treated pro athletes. Um, so it turned out I was almost done training camp and uh, the DMC had got back to me and said they actually wouldn't be able to sponsor my visa. It was going to take too long and they needed someone to be able to start right away. Um, so I was crushed. I was, I was really devastated. Um, but the, the Thai cats were like, well, this is great news. You know, you can stay on for us for the season. Um, so I ended up staying uh, for the season and it probably was the best thing for my career. I met a ton of great people and doctors and other practitioners. And then I ended up staying in Hamilton for another about three and a half years. I worked at a couple multidisciplinary clinics. Um, and then in 2012, the athletic director at St. Clair reached out to me um, and asked if I would be interested in, in um, covering a short-term contract for a medical leave. Um, and I was in no position to kind of leave my full-time work um, to go home for a short-term contract, but I really, really wanted to, you know, try my hand at the college or university setting. So I uh, kind of schmoozed my boss and, and made him let me take this kind of eight week contract. Um, and it worked out really well. And um, I, I kind of went back to work in Hamilton and I continued to cover some uh, field coverage for St. Clair when they traveled out to me in Hamilton. Um, and at that time they were building a, like a $26 million sports complex. And they had said, you know, just like, hang on, we, we've got a spot for you as soon as um, our new sportsplex opens. Um, so for about over a year, I was traveling back and forth from Hamilton to Windsor, working two days a week in Windsor and the rest of the week in Hamilton. Um, and it was crazy, but I, you know, I kept my foot kind of wedged in the door. And um, in 2014, I got a full-time position at St. Clair and, I've been there ever since and it's been great. Awesome. What a great summary and a great story. And and lucky for us, you know, that that Detroit Medical Center didn't work out in terms of Canada and like allowing us to keep you uh, sort of on our north of the 49th, I think, as they call it, and just keep you on, on Canadian soil. And and you talk about so many things that are important, right, in, in terms of your first mentor and who you worked with and what that impact really housed for you. And I think we'll get into that as we go along. Um, with everybody it might be a common theme, it might not. But I think that first sort of introduction to athletic therapy and having a real positive experience with uh, what the profession can be and sort of opening your eyes to what types of personalities there are within the profession and, and what, what animal, uh, animals, what avenues and channels there are um, out there, animals too. 
um, to, to really explore in the field is, is fantastic. So we appreciate you again, sharing your story and we'll get into, get to know you a little bit more and, and your road to this and through this as we go. But, uh, let's move on to Seneca. Steve, how, how about you, man? Just summarize uh, as best you can. Yeah. Um, I mean, my start kind of like started off similar to, to Kim's there, you know, at Waterloo, uh, went there for my kin degree, same thing as thinking, okay, I'm going to go physio, med school, something along those lines. Um, knew nothing about athletic therapy when I first went into university and uh, during the orientation week kind of got introduced to coming out to working with uh, as a student trainer. So I took the course and started working with the teams throughout the four years I was at Waterloo. Um, and again, a couple of colleagues that were at Waterloo went on to Sheridan um, ahead of me. And so that's how I found out about the athletic therapy program. And uh, went into Sheridan there and completed that. I was actually the last of the diploma program there. It used to be a three-year program um, before it switched to the four-year. And so I was a graduate last of the, the three-year program. Um, after graduating from Sheridan, it was okay to try and find a job. I was working lacrosse here in Brampton with the uh, Brampton Excelsiors um, and worked with them throughout the summers. But that was kind of basically volunteer um with the amount of money that we got and i'm sure jen will attest to that as well she's worked with the excel series <laughs> over the years um on it but uh stuck with them until about 2008 and won the man cup with them um and had the opportunity to work with the uh, men's uh field lacrosse team in 2010 uh, at the world championships in england um with a colleague of ours uh, steve lobsinger um and traveled with them um, when I first got out of Sheridan, I was, again, trying to find that job and, and actually started out in sales, um, an outside sales position with Trainer's Choice uh, up in Barrie there, um, going around trying to sell the product and, and clinical supplies in the GTA, and I was horrible at it, um, did not enjoy it at all. Um, and, uh, so they actually moved me in house and, uh, went into in house sales and brace fitting and everything like that with them for a few years. Um, when it, to get into Seneca, I, uh, I was, did a placement when I was at Sheridan at Seneca college. Um, and Steph Moser was the head therapist there at the time. Um, and she left to start her own, uh, her own gig and, um, contacted me probably about 2007, 2008. Um, let me know that the position at Seneca was, was coming up. Uh, at that point I hadn't really treated in the clinic or anything. I was doing sales and doing brace fitting and, and that sort of did. So I didn't feel like I was ready to kind of get into that role and be able to teach students in, in going through the program at that point. So I got into the clinic up at Barry Sports Medicine for a couple of years. Um, the position came around again at Seneca and she mentioned it to me again. And so I applied and got talking to the athletic director and she remembered me as a student there and got started in 2009 there. Um, it was as a, it was a part-time position at that point And I, Fought to kind of get it into a full-time role by 2015. And so I've been there since 2009 and full-time since 2015. Awesome. What a, what a cool road. And, and I, think it's, I think it's so awesome to hear athletic therapists and just kind of follow the path and the journey as we go along. It's, it's different, but it's similar. And, and as you're speaking, I'm kind of just jotting down notes. And, and, you know, when we get out of school, we're constantly in the moment that we're in, we're searching for a job. You know what I mean? Like when we're embedded in that moment, we're trying to find like that perfect fit or trying to find something. Mm -hmm. But then in looking back, you know, now retrospectively looking back at those times, it, it, it's not so much about the search, but it's actually that turns into the building of what you're, where you are now, right? Like looking back over time, that kind of built you into who you are, built relationships along the way. Um, and it's not necessarily that perfect job coming out of school, but it really is kind of navigating who you are and, and what values you hold as a therapist as you navigate those first couple years. And really, like Kim had mentioned as well, just kind of getting your foot in the door and then keeping it in there and either kicking it open and going through or at least keeping that dialogue happening as you move along so that, you know, down the road, you may not be great at sales, but you're great in-house because you understand the product, you understand its use, you understand these things. And that's going to benefit you now, obviously, or at the beginning of your time at Seneca in working with athletes where you can apply all of this stuff and teach about it and, and you know, and probably go back and now you could crush sales if you really wanted to. You could come back <laughs> around and, and just be that external sales salesperson if you so chose. But I don't a lot of great, a lot, yeah, well, yeah, well, maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, hey, sales is a different piece, but 
but uh, I always, I it just, it's amazing to hear. So appreciate you sharing your story and, and, and obviously uh, your time with us tonight as we get further along into this thing. Uh, let's keep working our way backwards. I think Jen, let's jump into to Jen Bell. She's at Humber College and Jen, um, jump in. Yeah, so um, my path is a little bit different than uh, than Kim and Steve's. They they talked about you know being in school and and kind of finding this. I actually was watching a Maple Leafs hockey game, and Chris Broadhurst was the the trainer. Uh, he's an athletic therapist, but he was the trainer at the time. And we I used to watch with my dad, and I wanted to do what he did. <laughs> And so I actually wrote a letter as a younger Jennifer to, uh, to Chris Broadhurst asking what it is he does and how do I do that? Now, I don't know if that letter ever got to him, but uh, then in my, my sports career, um, I actually, I played softball at a very high level um, and injured my so- shoulder. So the, ther- the physiotherapist I was seeing said that I needed surgery. Um, I actually got referred down to Dr. Julia Lean's clinic in Oakville and she was like, nope, you don't. But she set me up with a therapist, an athletic therapist there, um, who I saw and, you know, kind of picked their brains in that appointment as, as well as getting my exercises um, to learn more about the profession. From there, I knew um, I needed to get my undergrad. I needed to, you know, kind of starting to sort out the path that I wanted to take. So I went to Laurentian for um, for my undergrad. And Wendy Hampson and Sean Sharon were the therapists at Laurentian. And I did the, the internship program with them. And, um, you know, I think the connections you make in therapy, as well as the mentorship, really helps carve your path um, from Laurentian, Wendy, uh, helped connect me with the the program at York and Francis. I applied to York, got into therapy there, um, did my athletic therapy program. And when I graduated, uh, Francis was going on sabbatical and Andrea Preer was taking over as program coordinator for the year. And as soon as she got my exam results, she called me up and said, hey, do you want to come on board with us? We have wow. the outside placement um, so that was all the Canlan first, first aid shifts that I see many names on here that, uh, I helped <laughs> <laughs> supervise you guys doing, uh, yeah. and also connected me with the marking and grading and teaching some of the, the, um, athletic injuries labs and whatnot. So that was kind of my foot on the, the certified side. Um, from there in it would have been 2006. Lydia Henry was the head therapist at Humber and she was going on mat leave. And they had the, I guess they had somebody lined up for the position, but something happened and they um, weren't able to fulfill that. And they were scrambling because it was the week that all the training camps were opening up and whatnot. Lydia contacted Andrea at York and Andrea recommended uh, me for the position. And so, um, you know, from there, uh, I covered, that was Lydia's first mat leave. It was only supposed to be a nine-month contract, and then I was gone, but they created a new role for me as the assistant therapist. Um, so I stayed on, covered her next mat leave, um, and then she decided to, to focus more on her osteopathy, and I got hired as the, the head therapist uh, at Humber. And so it's, it's kind of funny, the connections you make. Um, as well, when I was a student, I was working, I was looking for something to keep my hands in it when I was, was a student and I went home and I worked with Andy Plater with the lacrosse team wow. in Owen Sound. Yeah. And from there, Andy connected me with the Brampton Excelsiors and then from Brampton with the national teams that I worked with and whatnot. So that kind of kept, kept things rolling on the lacrosse side as well. So, um, you know, the connections that you make are, are so valuable, um, with the Canadian artistic swimming. I've, I worked with Jen Langua, who's the head therapist with them on a committee. She needed some help. And so now I've been doing some, some work on the side, uh, for them. So, um, your connections are key through all of this. Very cool. What a, what a cool story. And like just navigating those things and you talk about connections and, and these times like in, in, uh, in COVID, you know, and, and, and the pandemic that is, uh, 
it's almost like, oh, how am I going to keep my career going? What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And, and we've kind of spun this thing around to make it a very positive experience through this platform to really have access to people like you where, where you know, Jen, Steve, Kim, Saul, uh, everybody who's been on here in the past and will be on here in the present really making themselves available um, to, to be mentors and mentees with each other and working together and, and creating that network uh, without having to be uh, necessarily in the clinic or I, Oh, I never got to have my placement with Jen. I wish I had, well, here you go. You have an opportunity now to sort of, you know, feel out your story, see who you are as a therapist and as a person. And I think these are really important conversations to have um, whether we take away uh, key points that we can apply to life, to the clinic, um, to career, whatever it might be. So I, I love that you're taking this time with us again tonight, everybody that's here and, and continues to be here or picking this up later on. Um, it just drives it home. And, and, and I think you should ask Chris, you know, let's, well, we can get in contact with Chris and ask him if he got that letter. You know, I'm sure he knows who you are at this point in time. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's, that might be a common theme as well. Cause, cause when I was starting out, I was doing my undergrad, I played a lot of baseball and, and then I reached out to the Blue Jays, you know, well, I reached out to all every single baseball team in, in major league baseball. I think when I was doing my undergrad and said like, how do I do this? Because there was no PBAT in Canada, you know, and, and the internet wasn't really the thing that it is now. You can't just find whatever you need. Well, you could, but I didn't know how. And, uh, you know, and I wrote all these letters and it was like, yeah, exactly. How do I do what you do? I want to do it, but how do I do it? And what is it exactly that you do? And those kinds of questions, like just putting it out there and being vulnerable to say, I don't know, but I want to know more. I think also goes such a long way in developing who we are as practitioners and, and human beings more than anything else, maybe. So uh, appreciate you being here. And, and uh, I don't know, let's keep rolling. Saul, uh, uh, Saul is at Ontario Tech and Durham College. Uh, give us your, give us your rundown, man. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, like a lot of the other panelists, I feel like I've had, you know, a mentor at sort of each level of the journey that I've been on. And, um, I started um, just before I sort of was working into the athletic therapy program. I was introduced to to it really through Diane McBain, who was an AT who was working in Oshawa and Newmarket Club Football. And she put a lot of trust in me, even though in retrospect, I had no idea what I was doing at that point. And um, it was a great, great experience. And um, from there, I working, you know, through the program at York, it was a fantastic experience. I mean, I feel like, you know, all of the support we had from Francis and Gus and Kelly, and Mike and Cindy Tracy in the clinic, I, I just really was able to progress every year that I was there. And um, I feel like especially Mike Boney was really influential with me. Um, he really, you know, preached the idea that there was no reason that ATs couldn't become the manual practitioners that these other professions were. And, and that always sort of stuck with me. So um, I had a great experience there, and I mean, connecting it back to the OCAA, I, I did get my opportunity to have a Jen Bell placement, and I was with her and Lydia at Humber and, and had great support there, and that's sort of when I fell in love with that, you know, college, university cohort, and uh, I'm sure we'll touch on that and what that has to offer, but um, I really enjoyed that environment and uh, had a great experience with the Argos in my last year of school. And so I had worked a lot of, of club football and then I went and did something totally different right when I graduated. And um, I, I worked at a multidisciplinary clinic in Woodbridge and that's where I saw a lot of things that I had never really, you know, um, had the opportunity to treat before, like, you know, an older population and OA patients and, and a variety of, we had some foot specialists there, so different conditions that I had never seen before. That was a really cool opportunity, and um, but I really missed that collegiate setting. And about a year in, when I sort of really committed to that clinic, I saw this posting for a fall contract for Oshawa, and I was like, you know what? I just driven out there for years, and I thought I was done with that, and I really couldn't make up my mind, you know, if I wanted to head back out there or or really focus on the clinic I was at. And in retrospect, it was kind of silly not to to really um even contemplate not applying but i really couldn't make up my mind and uh luckily you know the night before the applications were due just like you're supposed to my friend uh at the bar convinced me to send my resume in so from the bar i <laughs> emailed my my application in 
uh, the night before it was due. Um, so it turned out well, but in retrospect, that was definitely a good lesson that I learned there. And, uh, which, and one? Yeah, which, one, which, 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 which lesson just make sure you do everything at the bar. That's a good lesson. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like in this, in this field, like those, those conferences, uh, we had Gwen Berger on about a month ago and he was talking about all the good stories followed the rum, you know, the rum left the room and, and exactly. he would follow and hear all the stories, but yeah, lots of lessons to be had, man. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. You have, to, I guess you have to find the right level where it's not too many drinks that you forget how to send the resume in, but not too little that you, <laughs> you don't have the courage to do it. I don't know. So, um, that's it. Yeah, no, it was, I, I feel like it's been just like a, a fantastic opportunity. I, um, walking into something that originally again, you know, started as a, a fall contract and then blossomed into more months. And then I think I knew having both institutions, one in the OUA and one in the OCWA was a unique experience, but also one that had room for growth. And, and so um, I saw that opportunity and luckily was able to get uh, full time there a few years in and have been there ever since. And um, it's opened up, you know, other opportunities like uh, the teaching I've been able to do at the college or helping with the labs at the university. So there's lots of other unexpected opportunities that you get along if you, if you keep working at it. And i just felt so lucky to, to hit a job with two established ATs, um, Jess Salt there and Allison Chizuski. And I just feel like so lucky that I've been able to learn from them every year. Uh, they've been fantastic mentors for me over the last uh, almost a decade now, which is crazy to say. So, yeah. And here we are. Yeah, time t time flies, and just I don't know if they had PDFs back then, but like just save that PDF resume, and then the send is not quite as difficult after a couple of drinks. I guess I don't know. Yeah. It seems like it's a it's a pretty good lesson to have as long as the PDF is the right version, and you haven't named it something uh, that you can't remember. But no, some great stuff, man. And, and navigating sort of your career to get to where you got to, and and going through school, and and all the connections along the way, and and something that kind of came up as I'm listening to each of you tell your story is like kind of this question of like, well, what is it that exactly, like, what is athletic therapy? You know, it's this question at the beginning of like, what is it? And, and now that I've been in it for a while and been able to sort of host this platform and talk with lots of people, I, I've really kind of spun that question 180 degrees and said like, what isn't athletic therapy? You know, it's so broad and so far reaching. And I know that we're all housed. I mean, you guys as panelists are all housed within the OCAA, but such drastically different experiences um, you know, you know each other from the OCAA, but you have different mentors, you have different paths, you have different, uh, values and all kinds of things. And, and, uh, I, I just think that's, that's the key for me now more than ever is, is, is sort of opening all of our eyes to how broad the spectrum can be. Um, and within the OCAA, it's a pretty cool demographic, right? You have athletes that are going through school. Uh, they're doing a lot of different things. And, and Steve, maybe we'll start with you with this one, just because of the, uh, the concussion and the return to learn stuff that you've really pushed uh, at Seneca and hopefully, you know, OCAA wide and that's impacted other, other areas as well. Um, when did that become sort of uh, at the forefront for you and, and how is that housed within Seneca or the OCAA as far as you're concerned in terms of uh, putting return to learn at the forefront of concussion care? Um. I think a lot of it was just that like over the years that we were there, it was, you know, we were starting to see more and more concussions um, coming out. Um, and we've had discussions uh, amongst the group of us here that are on the panel here about this with our injury tracking and stuff um, that, you know, year over year, it seems to keep growing and, and whether that be from um, education and awareness of it and through the public and everyone kind of being more aware of it and now with Rowan's Law stuff in, in place and, and people athletes being more aware of the long-term consequences and and how it can affect them um, the return to learn aspect of it was we were having our, our our sport med doctor and us were having a real hard time with our athletes on them being forced to continue to work through their assignments once they've sustained a concussion and taking a long time through the counseling department to obtain those academic accommodations. Um, so we basically put together, sat down with the director of counseling, um, our athletic director, our sports med doc, and we all kind of sat together in a room and kind of said, well, how can we streamline this? Because we know that the more stress that they have, the longer their symptoms are going to last. 
um, which then keeps them out of school longer and affects their grades and also keeps them out of sport longer. So we wanted to come up with something. So we developed a, a, a plan to basically notify the counseling. So I notify the counseling department the day that they sustain a concussion and we get them their academic accommodations within 24 hours. Um, and then the doctor will certify that concussion within a week or two um, to the counseling department. Because in the past, they needed to have doctor certification of that first before they provided the accommodations. So we're able to get the athletes their accommodations within 24 hours, which takes that stress off of their their shoulders when they once they sustain a concussion, because that's always the first thing out of their mouth when they tell them that they need to rest for, for a little bit. And that first 24 hours, they say, well, I have a test tomorrow or I have an assignment due tomorrow. Um, and we can ease that that stress off their shoulders a little bit and know that it, they're not going to get penalized for not handing that in or, or, or handing it in later and stuff because they have those accommodations in place fast. I know that a lot of the other colleges in Durham and, and Humber and, and St. Clair, you guys are all kind of doing something similar now with that as well and, and a, maybe a different avenue of uh, accessing that, but same idea of getting that out there and into the, to the athletes' accommodations uh, as fast as we can. Oops. Yeah, it, it's a massive point. Sorry, I'm just getting messages that, that my audio might be choppy. So if it is, just let me know and I, I'll try to switch out my, my, my uh, mic here. But it's, it's amazingly uh, important. You know, it's, it's hugely important in our demographic um, that that return to learn gets put at the forefront. Um, and the fact that you've been able to expedite it by simply having conversations with all of those involved goes such a long way. You know what I mean? But where you can pull a sports doc, an athletic director, everybody who matters within this decision, house them in a room and have a conversation about it. I think that, that's clear. That's transparent. It drives home the message that this is important and it gets insight right on the spot to, to get it moving. Right. And that's a great lesson for, for anybody who's managing um, or working with other people, you know, it's clear and, and effective communication on the things that matter that really drives uh, yeah, it drives the importance of it and, 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 and all that matters for, for the student athlete, which is who we're caring for in, in this, uh, in your demographic and your setting, you know, it goes a long way. And I hope that, I hope that, uh, your athletes, your AD, everybody who's involved in these, uh, these situations and scenarios, um, is expressing their, uh, their gratefulness, uh, to you for, for driving this because it's massive and, and it really is. And I think, uh, anybody who has experience in this in this area or wants more knowledge, uh, Steve, I'm sure you'd be open for people to reach out to you and, and talk to you sort of about what this protocol means and how you push this thing forward. I'll I won't speak for you, but I will. Um, <laughs> just uh, it, it's no, of great course, to have yeah, absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's great to have access to somebody who, who's in a situation and, and really like you wear that as a badge you know what I mean and it's, and it's a really important one um, we sometimes talk about being on the field and on the sidelines and everybody has their little bits of their differences but but that's a huge one in especially in the collegiate setting absolutely um, Kim let's come back to you and, and you did your master's and you went to Buenos Aires let's stay just to the academic side of things we won't talk about the, the nice weather and all the other things that went on or if anything else went on I don't know it was a thing, but um, what did you present and, and have you found a way to apply some or all of that in the OCAA setting um, yeah, where you are now? Um, yeah, so I did um, a research study. Uh, it was an individual case study on uh, an individual with Friedrich's ataxia, which is, um, I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but it's a neurodegenerative condition and it's, it's pretty rare. Um, so one of my patients um, that I treat outside of the collegiate setting um, has this um, condition. Um, and it basically, um, some of the symptoms are uh, like imbalance, um, inability to use your muscles, how, you know, we would use our muscles um, and just general stiffness. Um, so I, had done my lit review and there was kind of no um, studies that were done using exercise and balance. It was all like drug related trials. Um, so I used um, this individual and we did um, a 12 week balance training regime. Um, and we actually did find some statistically significant um, improvement. It was marginal, but um, it was statistically significant. So um, I s ended up submitting my um, abstract to the this um, International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine uh, World Congress. Actually, my, my advisor had submitted it. Um, I thought there was no way that it would get chosen, um, and turns out it got chosen. Um, so yeah, I presented my abstract there in Argentina, um, and it was amazing. It was um, 
a once in a lifetime kind of trip. It was the Congress uh, is the majority is um, physiatrists and, and um, sports med docs. Um, but it was a really great opportunity to kind of present my work and uh, network with like minded practitioners. No, very, very cool. And congratulations on getting that done. Not too many people get to do any of that, you know, and, and uh, you talk about sort of like balance and its importance. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I found over the to- over the last little while in working with athletes, both from the highest, let's call it the highest level pro level, and then back down to amateur really focusing in on like that proprioceptive quality effort goes so much further than maximum, you know, maximum <laughs> velocity or maximum force, uh, maximum exertion, these kinds of things. And that's a generalized statement. I, I, I grant that. But the, the high quality proprio work has so much feedback and feed forward that I think there's, there's so much value in that. And, and I think driving that home into every rehab and every strength and conditioning uh, uh, opportunity goes a long way with athletes too. So I'm sure you're embedding that in, in virtually everything you do, although specific to, to certain cases. Yeah, for sure. Um, my case study was obviously a little bit different because uh, most of our athletes are pretty much healthy at baseline. Um, but yeah, like you said, I, I incorporate proprioception and balance into all of my uh, rehabs, especially, you know, concussions, um, anything ligament wise. Um, so, so that kind of balance training niche I've kind of created is um, I've, I've been doing it a lot with athletes for sure. Yeah, it drives the level of intent as well. Like neural drive is a thing that people use in terminology and then other people are calling it, uh, I don't know, uh, for our, our articular focus. And there's just different language for it. But really when there's intent in what we're doing, um, the balance component challenges the brain to be involved heavily. And, and that kind of draws in our athletes and our population to concentrate a little bit more maybe uh, in terms of what they're doing. So some great stuff. Uh, Jen, let's switch gears back over to you. And uh, you've been at Humber for a while, right? So how do you keep it, uh, how do you keep it fresh? 14 years is not, uh, it, it's interesting because every one of you is not at the place where you started. You know what I mean? Like everybody went away, they found something, they came back around to it. They might have ended up where they started, but they didn't stay there the whole time. And even if you are in the same place where you started physically, you're not in the same place where you started. So like 14 years in one place, let's call it the same place. Uh, You've grown, you've changed gears a lot. Uh, How do do you keep it fresh for you specifically as a therapist? What do you do for you to kind of keep yourself uh, on your toes, learning, interested, engaged? It's that it's the lifelong learning aspect. I mean, um, you know, when I was first starting out, I did a lot of the weekend courses, the Ann Hartley courses, um, you know, soft tissue, whatever I could, um, you know, financially and and feasibly take, um, you know, I took them. Then it uh, turned into doing uh, my master's. uh, And that has really kind of helped keep me fresh and, you know, new perspectives, different way of thinking uh, and whatnot. And then also um, now, I I guess, like later on, since I've been certified for 15 years, I'm finding that um, seeking people that treat the way I'm interested in treating. Um, So I've been following, you know, Scott and Jamie Livingston a lot. you know, just finding other practitioners that kind of have a, a similar approach. And, you know, so I listened to a lot of, uh, you know, the roundtables that, that they were doing um, through COVID and, and connecting with some of their guests and, and, you know, on Instagram and following those people and, and looking at their perspectives and then investigating it further. So, um, you know, not just taking what they're saying for face value, but investigating that, um, you know, on the, the academic side a little bit. Um, just to, you know, keep things, keep things fresh, um, you know, as well when you're, I mean, yes, I've been at Humber for 15 years, but I've seen lots of coaching changes. Uh, the athletes are always different. And that also drives you to, to keep things fresh and, and change your approach because, you know, coaches have different things that they buy into different communication methods, you know, all that type of stuff. And you have different athletes too. So um, I've seen a wide variety of injuries, um, some crazier than I ever thought that I would. Um, 
you know, so that keeps you on your toes as well. It's just, you need to, you need to keep moving forward yourself when you're in one spot for so long. So that way um, you're not getting stagnant and you're not plateauing uh, as a, as a professional. I love it. It's great to, to hear that, you know, um, I think sometimes, you know, we're all guilty of sort of plateauing at some point, both physically, mentally, and then in our workplace. And so um, to really utilize the space that you're in and then the people around you to, to sort of capitalize on your learning and, and challenging yourself. You know, it's also about um, finding people that are like-minded, but also finding people that are going to challenge you in the way that yeah. you think uh, in a meaningful and constructive manner. You know what I mean? Where you can read something or listen to something and say, huh. I haven't thought about it that way. Can I, can I go about things maybe a little bit differently? And, and then again, coming back to where Steve was at in the same room and having those conversations this time, maybe more than ever, we have a little bit more access to each other and having those conversations might be a little bit easier where everyone isn't quite as in person busy. They can take the time and have these conversations and the, and these go a long way. Yeah. I also think having the student therapist come into the clinic that definitely keeps you on your toes because man, yeah. they have some great questions. <laughs> and if you yeah. don't know your stuff, <laughs> yeah. they, uh, they certainly hold you accountable to that. So, you know, they, I mean, working with the student therapists, I think continues to make me grow because uh, you want to be able to have the answers and uh, for them. Yeah. And, and some not so good questions, which also <laughs> keep you on your toes. Student yeah. therapists and, and, <laughs> and colleagues alike, you know, I've been in the, I've been in the university setting as well and, and with colleagues and student therapists, you know, um, and just, yeah, it's a variable environment. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, this is uh, this is high level athletics, but in the therapeutic setting, right? Like everything's evolving constantly and moving and there's so many uh, moving parts to it that you never really know what you're going to get. So uh, yeah, definitely. And, and con continual growth and, and evolution as a therapist is, um, I would agree, 100% top, top of mind. Saul, you work in sort of a, a double cohort, right? Like you're working at Durham and, uh, and Ontario Tech. Uh, how does that work and how do you navigate sort of time and space uh, allotments within sort of, uh, yeah, the OUA and the OCAA? How does that work on your side? Yeah, it's definitely a, an interesting setup and uh, we're lucky that both schools are really supportive of our department. So um, there's definitely some difficulties at times trying to navigate space and time, like you said. Uh, I'm a shared service between both institutions. So you know, all the, the regular scheduling difficulties that we all try to, um, you know, match up once we get the season released, we've got to sort of factor in four soccer teams instead of two and how their schedules might conflict and whether or not, you know, OUA hockey um, may con conflict with some of my OCAA sports, things like that. But again, I think we're able to succeed because of the support we have. So um, from a staffing perspective, again, we've had a lot of support with the three full-time um, uh, ATs that we have and um, getting support from some contract therapists as well. And uh, the student support, like Jen mentioned, um, has been excellent and uh, keeps me on my toes as well. It keeps me grounded for sure. Um, and yeah, there's, there's only differences, I think, between the populations. Um, some more similarities than I think people would think, you know, but there's definitely differences as far as um, the athletes and you know the coaching staffs sometimes you have to marvel at at some of the things that our our part-time coaching staff are able to accomplish with the time that mm -hmm. they have and, and the resources that they have um and and then you marvel on the oua side with what the coaching staff there is able to sort of envision and put forward to keep pushing in that high performance setting so um, yeah, it's, it's cool because we get to see a, a bit of both worlds and uh, definitely it's a challenge um, at times um, to navigate the scheduling, but um, it's a really cool thing to see um, with the athletes and how they sort of mature over their, their time there, you know, that athlete that walks in and you can tell oh, you went to high school last year like you can really tell you know and then you know whether it be the college or the university and they really matured over their four or five years or even over the couple of years if they do you know a college diploma or something um it's really awesome to see so um yeah it's been a unique experience for sure but um i think we'll we're able to to manage it with a lot of planning and and support yeah, and, and, and uh, what a great job in terms of like managing your time and, and really kind of navigating that uh, from, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know if anybody else does it, right? Like college and university in the same space and, and all these things within the OCAA and the OUA. So good for you guys. I mean, kudos. It's It's got to be uh, time management, space management, human management, personal management, all these things that you have to stay on top of as an athletic therapist. And, and within the OCAA, we're seeing, you know, just in, in these conversations, seeing the variability within each setting is great because it shows you, shows me at least, and maybe everybody listening that, that it doesn't always have to be cut and dry one way or the other. You know, you have foundational principles we live by, but um, the rest of it you can kind of make work as the situation allows. And that goes for the conversations you have, the networks you create, um, and how we sort of build the profession outward. So uh, really great share. So I'll appreciate it. Um, uh, just a reminder, next five in on the membership, uh, uh, Mobility Tape will send a free roll of their product to you. Uh, that's, again, through courses on uh, firststartherapy.com CEU membership. Uh, let's come back around, uh, Kim, to you. Uh, worst injury you've seen in the college setting to date uh, and your response at the time or afterwards? Not like your response response, but, you know, how did things go in managing of that? Um, hmm. I guess, I don't know if this is the worst injury that I saw, but probably the most difficult to manage, um, was a GH dislocation, but the way that it was dislocated was just, it was really stuck. And the person was like very much going into shock and, um, difficult to calm down. Um, I don't know. I, th- I think that was probably like the most memorable for me because the, the screaming was just really intense and um, yeah, just, you know, trying to, to calm that person down or yeah, I would, I would say that's probably the one that I remember the most. Yeah. Awesome. No, it's a great insight. And, and to put you on the spot like that, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one to answer, right? We've all, we've all responded to different things over time and responded different ways. And, you know, GH dislocations with people going white or passing out or just like going like ghost and you don't know what's going on or you've never spoken to them before or it's an athlete, you know, the situation dictates uh, our reaction or our response um, most definitely. And, and uh, again, coming back around to what Glenn Bergeron had talked about on one of our previous is like all of the trust that we build with our athletes um, creates the calmness in that scenario where they know that they're coming to you. You know what you're doing. Uh, the, the calmness isn't necessarily uh, the focal point. The focal point is the GH dislocation, but uh, that trust they have to, to come to us as athletic therapists and, and know that uh, they're going to get proper care and taken care of, I think, goes a long way, too. So uh, a great share. Saul. Uh, words of advice to new grads. Uh, it can be one or it can be several words, but uh, what would you say in this at this point in time? Well, um, I think sort of like, you know, the story that we touched on uh, and, and Jen mentioned this earlier, but I think for new grads, it's to sort of the, the cliche of, you know, throw yourself out there and try to get as much experience as possible and um, send in your resumes even when you are not sure that you should. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, those cliches are there for a reason because it's true. I think you need to get a variety of experience. And I think the other thing for new grads is I just, again, because I feel so fortunate to be in the position I am and um, not to seem like I'm seeking some sort of pity party, but I don't think there's anything necessarily special about me. I wasn't, you know, like an A++ student. So I like to sort of share those stories sometimes with new grads to kind of say, you know, if you, if this is, you know, an area that you're interested in working and there's no reason why you can't get here, you know, and, and I think that goes for, you know, whether pro sport is your goal. I mean, you've got to love what you're doing and that's a whole other avenue or working in a clinic and really being able to contribute there. And you see these manual therapists and, and it's going to be difficult and and it's not going to happen overnight, but if you keep working at it, you can get there. And I think that's sort of the main message I, I would say is that um, don't be too intimidated. I, I still feel, I used to have these conversations with our students, especially one a few years ago, Lexi, who is like an amazing student. And she'd say like, Oh, when does it click? And, and you think like, I got it. Like, I know what I'm doing. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I've been here for eight years at that point, and I don't know when it's gonna click for me. Like, yeah. uh, I'm still waiting. And she's like, "Uh oh, that's not good," you know. So I think you know that's a normal feeling to have, and there's no reason why you can't get where you want to go. But uh, you're gonna have that feeling along the way because that's how I feel every day. You know, I 
I have days where I feel awesome and, and I love my job. And there's definitely days where I look at the other two therapists I treat with and I hope that I can treat as well as them some days or I walk into the OCAA room and, and I'm sure we can touch on like how our group has grown, but you know, I'm, I'm so like, you know, intimidated to talk to all the people in that room. And so it, it's been a really cool experience, but I, I think that would be sort of the takeaway messages. Uh, yeah, it's not going to feel like you're doing it at the moment, but you, you can do it. So. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Hu humility and modesty within sort of, you know, your answer. And, and I think those are characteristics that go a long way in this profession as well. You definitely house a lot of um, confidence when you're working every conversation you and I have ever had. Um, when you talk about what you're doing, obviously like passion shines through and you love where you're at and you're sort of uh, a, a lover of life and just kind of, you know, housing all of those things as you go through it, man. So it's a pleasure to have you on and hear you speak. And, and those are great words of advice. Um, Steve, let's move over to you a little bit of a different uh, path here. Uh, your latest read in terms of uh, AT specific and non AT specific. Um, I'm totally blanking on the name of the book I'm currently reading. <laughs> That's how well I'm into it. Um, yeah, title. No, titles don't matter. They don't. I mean, it's a good story. I'm kind of pecking away at it a little bit. I, um, with everything with work, with COVID and everything, I, I kind of have been redeployed. So I'm actually uh, we're doing groundskeeping at the college a couple of days a week now. So on our breaks, I, I pull out the book and do a little bit of reading there. Um, a little to try and just do something on our breaks a little bit. So, um, but yeah, so I've been kind of reading that and then AT specific things I've been reading most lately is, is protocols on safe return from COVID. So <laughs> yeah. no, beautiful. Um, hey, spot on. Yeah, yeah. So working on all that on, on how we can safely return to sport in the OCAA world, uh, hopefully in, in January at some point, um, and trying to put together all the protocols on, on what that would look like, uh, if, if we get the go ahead to do so. So awesome. And, and pulling out books when you have breaks is about the best thing you can do. So I think that's great. Um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, na navigating this time, right? Like redeployment, but being completely okay with that. And like just getting to the ground, doing your thing, you're still involved at the college and still involved with what things are going to look like moving forward. So that's great, man. I'm, I'm happy to have you on and you're sharing your story with us. And even if you don't remember the title of the book, you're, you're out there reading. So that's important, you know, yeah. keep going, keep going. Jen said, yeah, it's right? kind of continual fun. learning. It's nice it's a little bit on, uh, yeah, on Saul's stuff on uh, words of wisdom for new grads. It doesn't. Yeah. When you get into the field and you're going in as athletic there. You've been working as an ATX at the college for 12 years, and now I'm cutting grass and trimming, uh, pulling weeds and stuff for a couple of days a week, right? Uh, in the job and get back into the therapy at some point again. So you never know what you're going to end up doing. And that's it. And, it. and it all matters. Every part of it matters. So so keep going, man. You're doing a heck of a job over there and. And a heck of a job this uh, this evening sharing with us. So uh, again, really appreciate having you on, um, Jen. Uh, I know that uh, being a mom is a big part of who you are. Uh, you don't just define yourself as an athletic therapist. But speaking of defining yourself <laughs> as an athletic therapist, what do you or what have you told your kids when they ask you what your job is? How do you describe this to them? <laughs> um, so. I guess I should clarify the age of my kids. So my, my oldest is seven and then I have a four year old and a two year old. Um, my seven year old, when he was one traveled with me with team Canada for two weeks through a bunch of training camps we had. So he kind of, he's always gotten it. He's always been, you know, he's been with mommy to pra lacrosse practices and, and, you know, got to shoot around with the guys and stuff like that. So he gets it and he's just like, oh, mommy just fixes people. If they get hurt, she fixes them. Yeah. My other, my other two, <laughs> they don't quite get it. Um, my four-year-old thinks that I am a miracle healer. She's like, because she hears I fix people. And so now every time she gets hurt, she's like, well, mommy, you can make it better. Just, just do what you do at work and make it better. <laughs> So yeah, nice. uh, they, they haven't quite grasped that. Um, 
my seven-year-old thinks that what I do is the coolest thing because, I mean, we had a lot of strike days this past year uh, on the elementary school side. And so he came to work with me for those strike days and would hang out in the clinic and the baseball guys would come and take him to the gym and shoot hoops with him. And nice. he would sit in on some treatments and he would, you know, do all kinds of things. And so he thinks what I do is, and he comes to games, he gets gear, he, yeah, like, so the, our coach is constantly like, here's a hat, here's a sweatshirt, here's a whatever. So he just thinks that this is amazing. Uh, awesome. What a, what a great um, share. And just to have you, yeah, to have access to have your kids around and, and yeah. to, you know, be privy to what's going on and, and all that is athletics and athletic therapy, it goes a long way in sort of development and, and kind of, you know, piquing their interest. Maybe, maybe not that miracle healer or, or uh, just getting in the gym at an early age and seeing like this can be fun, but this can also be uh, a way to get an education too. So um, I, I don't know how, but it's already been an hour. This seems to just blow by and, and you guys have been fantastic. Um, I, I think we'll call it at an hour because I promised that to, to each one of you as we were coming in. Uh, this has been First Star Let's Chat, Session 36 with the OCAA panel. Kim Strosser from St. Clair College, Jennifer Bell from Humber College, Steve Kopas from Seneca College, and Saul Berman from Durham College and Ontario Tech University. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. Great shares uh, all night long. Um, really appreciate you being here, taking the time, spreading the word, growing this profession, doing what you do. If your athletes, your coaches, your ADs, your partners, everybody in your life haven't thanked you for what it is that you do, I'll do that on their behalf right now. So keep, keep this going, keep growing, keep learning. Um, this is what it's all about, sharing this profession, sharing what it is that we can be uh, as an integrative part of, of sports performance and, and you know, health care on the global stage. Um, this is where it starts with a good conversation. So really appreciate you guys being on here. Everybody's on here live. Thank you for being here as well. Um, and anybody picking this up after this will be uploaded to uh, to YouTube once again and to the podcast version as well as quickly as possible. Uh, just so you are aware, I'm going to do better at telling everybody what's next. So next week uh, will be Brady Leovold. Brady Leovold is a former um, professional hockey player who spent a lot of time in pro hockey and, and then spent some time living in the streets as a heroin addict. So uh, he leads a, a podcast called Heroin to Hockey or Hockey to Heroin. Um, and he's part of, uh, you know, a lot of growth in terms of understanding what addiction is and what addiction can be within the sports world. So I think it's going to open up a lot of eyes, a lot of channels to, um, to what those avenues may hold for us in the future as well. Um, so Brady will be on uh, next Sunday, the following Sunday, we're hoping uh, timing wise as well will be uh, a bubble chat from the CPL out in Charlottetown PEI. We have uh, athletic therapists from each uh, as many of the teams as possible that weren't playing at the time um, to be on from there. So those are the next two weeks coming up. Um, again, something for you, just from my end of things, I'm hosting a practitioner's retreat the 24th to the 26th of September. This is specific to any practitioner who works in, in uh, any model of care, uh, taking care of yourself. Uh, details are on the website if you so choose. Otherwise, just reach out to me. I'm happy to provide details on what that encompasses. But basically what that is, is load management um, and self-care so that you can be at your best, so that your athletes, patients, etc., can be at their best through you. So that's kind of the angle on that. Kim, Jen, Steve, Saul, really appreciate it. Kelly for her time, uh, but unfortunately not able to be here. Um, once again, First Star Let's Chat brought to you by Mobility Tape. Thank you guys so much this evening, and uh, I'll wish you good night and talk to you soon. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Thank Let's you. Go.